Our scripture reading this morning, I, I drew away from Philippians, so now we're into Galatians uh, this morning. Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 to 12. Galatians 5, 1 to 12, and reading from uh, the NIV version. If you have your Bibles there, great. Uh, if not, you can hear me. I don't have a PowerPoint for you this morning. Galatians 5, 1 to 12. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion, whoever that may be, will have to pay the penalty. Brothers and sisters, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. May God add his blessing on the reading of his word this morning. So interesting, uh, this morning I, I pulled a, a message back from actually N.T. Wright um, recently at seminary. We had to, we were given actually that text to preach from. I thought, how on earth do I preach that text? So I revamped it a little bit and um, I thought I'd share it with you renewed this morning from, uh, from Tyndale. So I hope um, you'll find it uh, a little entertaining and uh, you'll find a, a little bit of a different message or a different perspective from Paul this morning on, on that passage. So I entitled the, the sermon itself, The Little Things That Will Trip Us Up, whether it be black flies or circumcision. Bit of a funny title, I'll just leave it there. It's been encouraging and enjoyable to study unity and preach unity over the past while. And I thought it was time to break away with an entertaining story, I hope, and discuss the work of the apostles a little further in a shorter but fun way. I've been blessed that the Lord provided me with a career that has allowed me to share some fun stories, interesting events, an opportunity to see how God works through the strangest of circumstances when remembering those calls for service that are forever embedded in my memory. Jesus is truly our greatest storyteller. I hope I can just become a little close to what Jesus could do. I'm way off, just a little close. Part of my duties in police work was as a member of a tactical unit along with other responsibilities. As a young, young officer, most of us were adrenaline junkies, longing for the big calls. As a tactical guy, some thought we were a little touched and certainly arrogant, uh, yet we were trained to take the calls many couldn't. So I'll just use this name, JB. JB, his full name, I'll try not to give, was a great name for a bad guy, a movie name. Our team was called in to deal with a serious matter. JB had escaped on a short pass given to him while serving a sentence for a violent crime and was a member of a major motorcycle gang. A close source to JB was providing our intelligence officer with information that he had planned to rob a bank in a busy location in Peterborough. So our team was short as it was the end of May and holiday times were beginning. We had to work with just four team members out of a 10 member team. My partner Dan and I took the bank that was being targeted and set up surveillance, just Dan and I. We were geared right up and sadly we could not warn anyone as it would start a major frenzy of worry on a busy Lansdowne Street. Lansdowne Street actually where the Walmart is up in the, the uh, West End. Information came in that JB was not going to be taken alive and will kill any cops in the site. He will not return to jail and wanted nothing more to connect with his girlfriend, that was his only wish. That wasn't going to happen. He was armed with a machine gun pistol, so we were told. 
And this certainly could do a great deal of damage within a few seconds, plus the weapon could be concealed. It was a, a small weapon, quite powerful. So we were on high alert since we couldn't find him. He had the upper hand. We had tips, but he could have been watching us as we sat and wait. We were a little nervous. The long day came and went without incident, except JB was still loose. No robbery occurred. We are now 24 hours in, getting a little tired, looking at this bank that never happened. Dan and I stayed on for the night shift, or the next shift really, as the next bit of intelligence had been validated that JB was going to pick up a Harley Davidson motorcycle left for him on a porch in the north end of Peterborough. The Tech 9 machine gun was still in the conversation, along with the jargon, I will not go back to jail. I picked up a marked police cruiser as this event could end up in a police pursuit. We were hoping not, but suspected it could. We needed to have the emergency lights and siren. So the day and the night dragged and Dan and I took turns resting as we were into day two. Plainclothes officers were watching this motorcycle from a surveillance van. We thought, well, another dead run and we're at least 35 hours in now. And suddenly we get the call over the radio. JB just arrived, jumped on the bike, started it. Our plainclothes officers had him in sight. So Dan and I jumped into action. He was in an unmarked car and I took the lead in the marked car. I was on point on this call, which isn't always a nice place to be, but I was. Driving quickly with hopes of stopping this fella who was now driving aggressively on Park Hill Road, trying to get out of the city. So I'm behind him early, the lights are on, but there's no stopping. I feared that he would just turn around and spray me with bullets from this Tech 9 machine gun that he supposedly had. He had a leather coat on, unzipped. I assumed the gun was concealed in this coat. So I had to broadcast the pursuit and the location. I was behind him. And Harleys are not that fast and rather awkward for maneuvering, but he was fast and he was a good rider. He slowed down dramatically on the bike. I thought he was getting ready to shoot at me actually. We're still on Park Hill Road for those that know Peterborough. Police cars were being told to stay away. Well, that's impossible because anybody knows they're all running parallel along side streets to watch. So I thought he was actually going to turn around, but instead he took off his helmet and tried to throw it back and put it through the front windshield of my cruiser. So he missed, thank goodness. So I had all my lethal equipment ready to go. I had it on my lap, I had it on my seat. I was all good to go. And the chase was now getting a little heavy. We're headed out of town and we're approaching Highway 7. And we know that Highway 7, if you've been down that way, Highway 7 and Park Hill Road is a T intersection. So I thought, well, when he hits that, he's not going to make it because he's got to make a nine, he must make a 90 degree turn at that intersection, make a left or right, whatever he's going to do. It's not going to happen. So there's no way he was going to make this 90 degree turn, in, in my opinion. And Harleys don't turn easy, especially these big ones. And there's also a stop sign. It's now a traffic light, but here it's leading up to a busy highway although it's dark and early in the morning. So I thought it would be all over. I pulled back. Well, doesn't JB make this corner? The sparks are flying from the crash bars in the bike. I've never seen anyone make a corner like that with a Harley. This guy could ride. <laughs> My prayer is, wasn't that, that he wasn't that good at target practice. He was a good rider. I hope he couldn't shoot as well. That was my, my biggest fear. So what is going to trip this guy up? He eluded, us, he eluded us for two days. He made an impossible corner. He showed little fear or no fear. And I feared this machine pistol, let alone his great bike riding. How will this end? Will he get hurt? Will we be shot? What is his plan? But right now he is in control and he's leading us. Very quickly after making this wild turn, he slows and slows right near the cabin swamp. Anybody knows the cabin swamp? We're not far out from Highway 7 and Park Hill Road. It appears he's going to dump the bike. He slows right down, slows right down. And I'm broadcasting this over the radio, preparing for a firefight. He hits the shoulder. I'm right behind. He drops the bike on the gravel and he runs in the cabin swamp, covered by darkness trees and loads of thick wick wickets. So I jumped out of the cruiser after stopping behind him, ready to open up with whatever was going to happen. He slipped away. I couldn't see him. And I couldn't shoot. I haven't seen this alleged gun. I couldn't risk shooting a man in the back, an unarmed man particularly, despite his threats to everyone. So I pulled back. So the OPP dog, he arrived. He wouldn't go in either. So I was a little annoyed with Apollo, the, the police dog, but I loved Apollo. And pleased his handler didn't take the risk. 
And he wasn't as dull as I was. He said, if you're not going in, I'm not going in either. And besides, Apollo is bigger than I. The dog and I both knew this guy could see us, but we couldn't see him. This investigation was becoming dangerous. Being on point, you know who will be taking the heat. It will be me. However, this goes, it's all on me. I was sweating now over the thoughts of my supervisors, not JB. So the OPP helicopters called in. More money to my budget on this call. I'm sweating just a little more. So they picked up an infrared image on this helicopter. And they said, oh, it's likely a deer. Although it could have been JB. Deer and human size can be similar on infrared scopes from a helicopter. So, and of course it's the one we're paying for by the hour. So from a place of cover behind my cruiser, there was an awful silence going on despite all the police coverage now in place. It was just dead quiet. 12 hours go by since Apollo and I pulled back from the woods. I figured it's over, he got away. It's almost three in the morning or three in the afternoon now, sorry, it's three in the afternoon. It's hot, I'm exhausted. We're living on adrenaline. My thoughts, boy, are they going to be mad at me for the bill on this? We still don't have this guy in custody. Suddenly, from a never ending radio silence, a radio crackle, 1092. This is the code for an arrest. So I think, I have one in custody, states another team member. I could have jumped for joy. Apollo the dog, I'm sure, was sleepy, but I jumped for joy. JP was, was the alleged deer in the brush and swamp. He staggered out to the north side of the road, through the swamp, crashing through the brush heavily. He pulled himself up out of the swamp, got on his knees, and was met by a well-armed team member, my friend Doug. And JB yells in anguish, I give up. I can't take it anymore. Those black flies are eating me alive. Get me out of here. So he was handcuffed and taken to the station. All those threats, having the upper hand with the threat of a Tech 9 machine pistol. It wasn't the police that took him. It wasn't a bad accident during the chase. It wasn't gunfire. It wasn't hundreds of, it was hundreds of tiny black flies eating out away at him for 12 hours. And those cops just wouldn't leave. I quietly rejoiced being the guy sweating away for the backlash if his takedown failed. The day ended well for us. And it was the little things that ruined all kinds of street credibility for JB. Although I give him credit for his bike riding and keeping me up for three days. And that didn't include the paperwork. That was days afterwards. So that was fun and very true. But what seems like the little things in our Christian journey can trip us up and cause horrible friction among the fellowship of believers soul altering ramifications and repercussions greater than machine guns and black flies as our journey has life altering and eternal implications we see in this letter by paul to the church in galatia despite excellent evangelism and the good works being done in ephesus the battles waged between jew and gentile who are working into a belief system where the jews felt most entitled as the chosen race and the gentiles feeling just as entitled since they say well, it was you who killed our Lord. He was Jewish. You yelled, crucify him. Both cultures were empowered for all the wrong reasons. Earthly power, not the endless power we should be seeking by his spirit and unifying the believers through Christ. Paul was battling these cultural religious issues that may seem trivial, yet common since the beginning of Old Testament roots in Christian day Christian culture or present day Christian culture. Circumcision and food, ingrained covenantal issues kept rising to the surface. Even Peter was playing both sides of the coin. He was eating with Gentiles and would do this in a devious way as he was afraid of being seen by the legalist Jews or, or zealots who believed that all Gentiles must be circumcised to be truly part of the Christian body. Another step beyond simply accepting Jesus as Lord of our life. And there was an assumption that Peter was eating unclean food with the Gentiles, even if the food was not kosher. Does it really matter compared to the worldwide shadow of the outstretched arms of an empty cross? They were missing it. And it's frustrating to read. I was named well, as my mother sits beside me, as I relate to Peter on the sneaking around, as I sense Peter may have fell back on old ways. He's forgetting the grace, peace, and love Jesus extended to him continuously. Jesus did the work. 
He was hiding from his fellow Jews, forgetting all that he was personally taught by our Lord, playing both sides. Paul had to address this. So if you look at, at verse 1, it is for freedom that Christ has set us, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. The yoke is slavery, and in this case, referring to the bondage of law. Jesus came for that reason, to break the chains. Abraham Lincoln, in a speech near the end of the Civil War, speaking to the oppressed, my poor friends, you are free, free as the air. You can cast off the name of slave and trample it. Liberty is your birthright. Daryl Dash is a New Testament commentator. He says, if you were a follower of Jesus Christ, you are free. You're free from the penalty of sin, from the power of sin, from the law as a system of salvation. You are free from superstition and from all that enslaves you. John Stott does a good job of explaining what this freedom is all about. It's not the freedom to do whatever we want. John Stott defines true freedom as freedom from my silly little self in order to live responsibly in love for God and for others. Paul does not mince his words in verse 2 as he hammers home the pettiness of circumcision and legalism compared to the labor of the unfathomable love represented by the cross. Verse 2, mark my words with an exclamation mark uh, Paul has here, mark my words, Paul tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Those in Galatia became so caught up in the little things, they were forgetting the big picture of Calvary. We can sense Paul's aggravation, if not a sense of urgency. He is bas basically telling all of us, not just the Galatians, but the global church of today, don't let the Torah actually fulfilled trip you up. The apostle is considering the Old Testament fulfilled, focusing on unity among all. If you are banking on circumcision, and food to save you, the work done by Christ was foolishness and futile. If this is how twisted we are becoming, as Paul says, Christ will be of no value to us. That is such a strong statement. This is, must have been a difficult time for everyone as the apostles and other followers of Christ attempted to teach how the law was fulfilled by our Lord's sacrifice. Paul makes it incredibly clear that working to be justified by the law is pushing Christ to the side. Jesus is alienated if the church in Galatia attempted to force Old Testament covenants into the new covenant. And I'm sympathetic to all those struggling in Galatia as how confusing it must have been at that time. The Jew who was steeped in covenant and Gentiles who came from all types of pagan religions and beliefs. These New Testament trailblazers made the cross so difficult at times but so do we do today, we do the same thing. But Jesus made it so easy, yet we often go to great lengths to confuse the simplicity of Christ dying for us. God incarnate, taking our sins from yesterday, today and tomorrow and redeeming us without trial, without question, no rituals with a scalpel, food uncleanliness, just freedom through faith in the life-saving blood of the lamb. The little things, that trip us up compared to the Son of God nailed to a Roman cross. I will be bold and suggest that today's Christians should know better as we have been, we have been given a greater understanding through 2,000 years of great theology, yet we continue to struggle at times with the little things. Not Old Testament covenants, our issues in, compar in, comparison, in comparison are the choir director, our programs, my ministry is better than that person's. We've got gift conflict. Paul is asking the body of believers to step up and address the issues with Paul's passion, firmly with strong exhortation and encouragement. All things done in love and encouragement, even the issues that might upset us personally. These issues that became so problematic, explained by a commentator. The most dangerous thing that can happen to you is that you become proud of your obedience. 
the most dangerous thing that can happen to you is that you trust in your own obedience rather than in the perfect work of Jesus Christ. That hits home with me. It really should make all of us look a little deeper at the redemptive life freely given by Christ, a salvation we do not deserve, yet his love reigns and he holds on to us despite the black flies. As suggested by those who have tackled Mount Everest, even the smallest misstep can be fatal, not only for you, but an entire team. I appreciate the strong and bold remarks of, of uh, Dash, another commentator. He said, when the little things trip us up, three things are at stake. Christ and his work will be of no value. We see that in verse two. In verse three, we become debtors to God's entire law. And verse four, we are cut off from the grace of Christ. Paul provides the most wonderful solution, spirit-inspired words. Let's listen to the comfort verse once again, or comfort verse for me, verses five and six. For through the spirit, we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. We are, for, we are free, however our traditions view atonement. So what will trip us up today? Will it be the black flies, circumcision, food, legalism, self-love, sex, drugs, alcohol, or teaching, God, or teaching God's word in a contrary way? The work has been done. Let's make it easier for ourselves and all those who look to us as an example of Christ alive within us. Lay at the foot of the cross and make love the first step to engage in any theological debate. If we do that, so much of our pettiness and legalness, legalism will be quickly as put aside. And the little things that could bring us down, bring a church community down, might be minimized or eliminated as we listen and seek direction from his Holy Spirit. The empty cross outpowers and outdoes an unlimited amount of wayward criminals with guns. A noble run by our incarcerated friend JB, but he never expected those little things, the overwhelming annoying bites from the early season of black flies. Arrest me, I can't take it anymore. I had an interesting frightening and exhausting three days in the area we know as Pinto's Corners. Yet who knew the Lord would use a dangerous bank robber to help us in a small understanding of Galatians. God bless all of you as we work through these challenging issues. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, May we be encouraged to remember that conflict and questions will be part of our journey with you on earth. But one day, the mysteries will be unlocked, the questions answered. Help us to teach everything through prayer and the guidance of your Holy Spirit. We are thankful for JB, who taught us a great deal and did not act out on his violent threats. We are thankful for the many events where your hand was on the shoulders of my colleagues and I even when I was walking far from you. The little things trip me up regularly. May we all remember what is at stake when the cross is not in the center of all we do. We pray for our churches, wherever they are at, in peace or in conflict. Trouble is everywhere. Through your spirit, give us the wisdom to deal with the internal and legal issues we are up against. You are in control. We love you, Lord Jesus. Guide us in our time of needs. In your precious name, we pray. Amen. I'm not going to go with a closing hymn this morning, but may I send you out with this benediction, one of my favorites as well. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.